crazy to think that it's been 20 years already. Uh, when I look at my athletic career, I went to four Winter Olympic Games and you know, from when I started speed skating at age eight to when I finished at 28, that felt like a lifetime. And the next 20 years since then feels so much quicker. You know, I've got, I've got three young kids and a, and a fairly normal lifestyle these days, but certainly some uh, lifelong memories from what happened on the 16th of February, 2002. My wife threw me a big party for the 10 year anniversary of the gold medal. Friends, family, there was like a hundred people there. The media came and it was, it was a big deal. And it felt like that that was it. Okay, it's been 10 years since the gold medal. I don't have to talk about that race anymore. And I don't mind talking about it. It's, you know, one of the highlights of my life, but now we're 20 years down the track and people still want to go back and talk about that race, where they were and what they were doing when they first saw it. I followed my dad's footsteps into the sport. As you mentioned, he was the national champ a couple of times back in his day. And for me, the initial attraction was the speed. And that's the case with most winter Olympic events. It's how fast you can go. And you know, for, I suppose a, a part of the attraction for me was the danger as well. I like to go fast and I like that adrenaline that comes with that. Uh, and so that's what led me into the sport. And I made the national team when I was 15 and, and prior to that, my dad used to push me. He forced me to go running and cycling with him before school and I hated him for it because I, I couldn't see a point. You know, I wanted to skate fast, but I didn't want to go out on the road every morning before school and bust my ass doing kilometers all the time. But he wanted to get me fit because he could see that I potentially had a future in the sport. And I snuck my way controversially onto the Australian national team when I was 15. I was the reserve. I went to the World Championships in Amsterdam. I didn't skate as the reserve, but I was sitting in the grandstand and I watched this Japanese skater. His last name is Kawasaki. Same as the motorbike, Toshinabu Kawasaki. And he did this amazing wide crossover line, like when they go wide in NASCAR and they get on that on the bank and it, they go further, but they go faster. And you can do that in speed skating too, but it's really difficult to get right. And he got his crossovers exactly right for about three laps, pulled off this amazing pass, what got the gold medal in the thousand meter final, broke the world record by 0.8 of a second. And I was sitting there in the grandstand and I, I said to myself, I'm gonna do that one day. And that's the last time I needed my dad to push me. And from there it was, wasn't a question of if I was going to the Olympics, it was how many and where I was gonna finish. I had two major injuries in my skating career. The first was a little earlier, I was 21. I was unlucky enough to get impaled on the back of another guy's skate doing 50 kilometers an hour. His blade went into my leg through there, pushed on an angle, came out the other side and ripped straight back out. I lost three quarters of my blood in a minute, four liters on the ice. Survived just, got 131 stitches in my leg. And the other one was 18 months before I got the gold head first into the barrier in a training crash in Brisbane and fractured the C4, C5 and C6, so I broke my neck. Had a halo brace screwed into my skull for two and a half months, pretty much resembled a human building site. So yeah, they were the, they were the big ones, but when I broke my neck, I had, I had two and a half months to think about what I'd done and what I still had ahead of me. And everyone around me was telling me that I've had a pretty good career. I had three world championship medals, a gold, a silver, and a bronze. I had an Olympic bronze medal in the relay, which was Australia's first winter Olympic medal. Even my mum said, it's been a pretty good career, Steve. But for me, I'd unfinished business because I'd skated at three winter Olympic games, the biggest stage in the world, and I hadn't skated my best at any of them. And it was doing my head in. So if I had to pull the pin there, when everyone told me I should, and the doctor who screwed that halo brass into my skull, he told me that I would never skate again. I just packed my stuff and went to another doctor because I had unfinished business. And when I got to Salt Lake City for that fourth Olympics, it wasn't about winning gold anymore like it was in the three Olympics prior to that when I really was a realistic gold medal chance. 
but in Salt Lake City, I was a little past it and I just wanted to finally skate my best at the Olympic Games when the whole world is finally having a look at what a speed skater from Brisbane is up to. Because that only happens once every four years. And all I wanted to do was my best on the world stage. So then I could retire knowing that I'd been able to do the best that I could possibly do when it counted. And I did that in Salt Lake City in the quarterfinals. I skated as good as I possibly could. I got through to the semis and from there, the rest of the world fell over in front of me and it was good enough for a gold medal as well. Yeah, well, probably one of the things I struggled with throughout my skating career was being able to find my peak at the right time. You know, I remember breaking world records in training and then by the time I got to world championships at the end of the season, I'm skating like a busted ass. And finding that peak was always the thing that I couldn't figure out. And when it happened, I tried to repeat it the next season and it failed. So in Salt Lake City to, to do what I considered to be my absolute best was gratifying. And that peak wasn't as good as what it would, could have been four years or eight years earlier when I was the favorite to win the thousand meter event in the Olympics didn't work out for me then and you know it was it was gratifying to know that after that quarter final I sat in the change room and I had this ultimate feeling of personal satisfaction wash its way through my body because I went to Salt Lake City to do my best in front of the world and in that stadium it felt like the world was in there 16 and a half thousand people in the Utah Jazz home stadium in Salt Lake City and after that quarter final, to know that, the goal was complete. After the quarter final, I'd done my best and there was moments there of huge relief and I maybe following that, you know, having that clarity, the experience, the judgment, and probably more so knowing my own limitations, knowing that I wasn't as good as the guys in the semi-final or the final, and my best chance to get something further was to stay out of the way. There's no point mixing it up with guys in the beginning of the race that you know are going to be ahead of you at the end of it anyway. So whilst I'm the luckiest individual Olympic gold medalist in the history of sport, there was some experience and judgment that went into that tactic. Thousand metres is nine laps, 111 metres a lap, two laps to go, no more legs. I'd skated the heats, the quarterfinals, the semi-final, and the final within about two hours. I'm a little bit past it to skate four races that quickly. Two laps to go, I had nothing. And I started to drop off the other four skaters. And once you get about four or five meters off, you lose the slipstream. The rubber band breaks, and then the gap blows really quickly. And yeah, that for me, that was disappointing that I'd that the rubber band had broken and I'd dropped off the pack because that had hadn't happened to me before in an international competition where I just couldn't keep up. And so when I saw the Chinese guy fall heading into the last corner, I thought, well, that's fourth. That's not really any better than fifth. And then out of the corner of my eye, I saw the rest of them tumble. And I knew at that, at that exact split second that I didn't have to skate. All I had to do was glide. I knew I was crossing the line first but I had no idea what the appropriate reaction was. And the look on my, my face tells the story. There was a media conference the day after Elisa had won. And we'd met each other before, but when we locked eyes at that media conference, it was just like, we both knew what each other was thinking. And we're not best mates, uh, but we're friends. But you know, we don't call each other up every every month and say, "Hey, you going?" But you know, we have that bond of those moments that were incredibly intense. That we were both feeling the same thing at the same time. And the Australian, the the vibe in the Australian winter team there in Salt Lake City was off the chart. There was a few days there when we had two gold medals on the medal tally and Australia was ahead of Austria on the Winter Olympic Games medal tally. 
Oh, there was one in the Australian, it was probably 10 years ago now, uh, not long after the global financial crisis, when all the currencies around the world were dropping, tanking, and the Australian dollar was, you know, when we were at 107 to the US dollar, and they had uh, the, the cartoonist had drawn the Australian dollar going across the finish line like this, and all the other currencies in behind it, the US and the pound and, and the Japanese yen, they were all on the floor. So that was, that was pretty fun. All the time, yeah. Yeah, people, you know, tell me when they did a Bradbury in there, in their under 18s footy comp or you know they play D grade tennis on a Thursday night and everybody's got a got a story about you know where they had a bit of luck and I think it's pretty Australian that we like an underdog victory but on the flip side of that I think in some ways we could probably learn a little bit from the US culture in they tell their kids that they can be the best in the world. Whereas we just tell our kids to be good at something. And sometimes if someone gets too good, that tall poppy thing kicks in, which I don't like that much. And I do it myself. I remember when Kieran Perkins was winning every race in the 1500 for six or seven years. There was a little part of me that was like, geez, I'd like someone to beat him one day. You know, just because he'd won for so long and that's, you know, that's something that I don't know if we should instill in our children. Incredibly proud to be Australia's first Winter Olympic gold medalist. Incredibly proud to have Elisa Camplin's suit standing next to mine here in the Sports Museum. And also incredibly proud of the saying that is now used regularly in the Australian vernacular, doing a Bradbury. That I'm confident now will outlive me. And if that saying inspires kids in the future, when their parents Google the race and have a look and say, look, this bloke tried his guts out at something for a long time and he was lucky, but he was in that position. And if you're able to give all of yourself to something and become elite at something in your life, maybe something like that can happen to you too. That's a pretty good lesson for our kids, especially with all the, the negativity and the garbage that they see on social media these days.